Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Star Wars Andor, Episode 1. I am loving this Rogue One prequel series for its grounded depiction of the Star Wars universe, like being unafraid to open in a brothel? No Grogu's loud in here! Though considering the younglings who kicked off the last Star Wars show, kids might be safer in this one. I am going to break down all the Star Wars Easter eggs and the subtle details that make this show so great. And thanks to Boxu for sponsoring this video, more on their tasty offerings later. So every Star Wars Disney Plus title opens with a red and blue lit series of familiar droid faces and metallic helmets. This one is updated to include B2 EMO, or B2, the ground mech salvage assist unit new to this series. The Andor title card shows an eclipse in space, the crescent of that planet becoming a rudimentary version of the Rebel Alliance symbol, representing Cassian Andor's evolution from an undefined planet hopper to a fully fledged rebel soldier. We open on the rainy, planet of Morlana 1, where the title lists the year as 5 BBY. Now, if you've been following Star Wars, you know that BBY and ABY stand for before the Battle of Yavin and after the Battle of Yavin. In this case, five years before the events of A New Hope and Rogue One. But what's interesting here is that this is the first time where BBY has actually been used on screen in a Star Wars show or movie. BBY and ABY have certainly been used among fans, and the new Essential Chronology reference book from 2005 suggested some in-universe characters use the Battle of Yavin as a kind of calendar year zero, but Star Wars has never until now actually shown the letters BBY on screen. But this series is clearly trying to match Rogue One, which did use on-screen titles for locations, and this Rogue One prequel series is essentially a ticking clock toward that battle. Priox Morlana is the name of a private corporation contracted by the Empire to oversee this system and run their security internally, kind of like the Wayland yutani Corporation from the Alien franchise. Grand Moff Tarkin had kind of a, a smug outlook that was all about delegation, how just the fear of the Death Star and the regional governors would keep everyone in line. This is an extension of that. They're literally contracting their security out to a private company. Now, all this rain over the walkway lamps, the amazing synthy score from composer Nicholas Bertel, the security hovercraft in the background with their searchlights, all of this gives off a noirish cyberpunk feel, akin to Blade Runner, which is also the influence for the Rings of Kafreen in Cassian's intro scene in Rogue One. Cassian passes these display bubbles with some folks to have some fun with, folks to maybe fight or to bet on, and in the background, you can hear a female worker say, no credit, no nonsense. Yeah, that sounds a lot like the voice of the freaking midwife droid on Polis Massa in Revenge of the Sith. Uh. 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 According to StarWars.com, Uba is kind of a comforting cooing sound. So one of these Morlana workers is pitching themselves with the warm bedside manner of an OBGYN. That big mean empire's so hard on you, baby. Let's relax and Uba. <laughs> Inside, some hollow projectors beam a dancer, reminding us of the hollow projected Twilight dancer watched by the partisans on Jedha in Rogue One. So Cassian is looking for a girl from Kinari, but the hostess says that they have a girl from Tahina, who she says has those big dark eyes that you're looking for. Both planets are new to Star Wars, and the suggestion really is that people from Kinari and Tahina have dark features. Cassian asks for the name of the Kinari girl that the hostess had seen, and the hostess says, Nobody here gives their real name. An interesting stated theme for this series. This will be a show about deceit. People's declared identities are rarely who they really are. The two cops, Kravas and Verlo, chase down Cassian because this is an employee-only area off-limits to people not on the corporate payroll. This whole idea of company towns is also explored in Loki with the Roxxon-owned Haven Hills, Alabama. A bit of biting the hand by directors on this platform that's owned by a studio that essentially runs company towns with their own legal jurisdictions. They ask, What do you swim over? You swim over, Strono. Yes, yeah, surrounded by water in literal bubbles in this opening sequence frames Cassian as a metaphorical, at least, evolutionary amphibian, transitioning from sea to land. The guy really has been adrift in an ocean, and he's now on a hero's journey to walk a path. After wrestling a blaster from their hands, Cassian says, Tell me what to do! Let's hear it, boss! Another motif throughout this episode, pretty much every scene ends with a character telling Cassian exactly what to do. Make yourself useful! Now go fix your face. Finish up. Get out. Don't come back. He's still a wanderer who needs this direction. Now Verlo doesn't get up, and Kravis says, Give it me, me. That thunderclap was kind of a thud of realization for Kravis. Don't make a guy feel like he has no other way out when he is still holding the gun on you. But Kravis still tries. We played too hard on him, and you didn't understand him. He tried to grab you and, and he fell and he hit his head. We're going together. I'll tell them what happened. 
Yeah, coming up with this whole false story of what really happened. This tactic comes up throughout the episode for many characters. Specifically, Cassian later uses this with Brasso. There are two guys conspiring on an alternate version of the night before his events. It's almost like Cassian gets this from the Sentry. And on to the planet Ferrix. This is actually part of the same system as Morlani 1. Its name is likely based on the term ferrum, the Latin word for iron, which is why its chemical symbol is F-E, kids. Which reflects the rusty color of this planet, the way the ground is just rusty red, and all the scrap metal of these Clone Wars era ships being broken apart to build a new fleet for the Empire. The town of Ferrix is actually a practical set, constructed in a former quarry in the UK town of Little Marlow in Buckinghamshire, giving these actors a full town to walk around in, as opposed to the LED screens of the volume that's been used in other Star Wars live action productions. Our new favorite droid of B2 EMO rolls past a building with Orbesh, translating to Ferrix D something, and then beneath, speeders available. In episode three, this will be the building where they hijack those speeders to get away. B2 stops. <laughs> These boars look like the blade back boar. This is from the Star Wars Galaxies game. B2 rolls up to sleeping Cassian on the ship that he took to Morlani 1, now parked in the shipyard. C -c Cassian, I brought what you t -t told me. Cassian. Cassa. 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 So B2 is voiced with an adorable stutter by Dave Chapman, a longtime voice actor who actually puppeteered BB-8. But in this show, they usually let the people who puppeteer the character also voice the character. Now, we don't know if in this scene, B2 actually calls Cassian Casa, or if Cassian hears the voice of the droid in his dream calling him what his sister Carrie called him. This flashback shows the planet of Canari, where a riverside tribe of youths react to a Republic-era vessel crashing overhead. And I say Republic because if Andor is set in 5 BBY, anything before or 14 years prior to that would be Clone Wars era or earlier. That was before the Republic gave way to the Empire. Notice as that ship crashes, a secondary explosion releases a trail of yellow smoke, a clue that it was a kind of chemical bomb that caused this crash. Now, I have heard from a bunch of new Rockstars viewers that have already signed up for Boxu, but for the uninitiated, Boxu is a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings straight from Japan to your door. They source rare snacks from all over the country and partner with family businesses to make their own signature treats. All of these are curated and delivered under a new theme every month. And this month's theme is Matsuri Nights. So the Matsuri Nights box is custom built to take the magical feeling of wandering through a Japanese festival at nighttime and pack it into a box. And here's the thing, they nailed it. I'm gonna try the Ido Matsuri Ningyoyaki cake. It's a doll shaped cake baked in a small iron mold and filled with custard. Mine is in the shape of a taiko drum. Mmm. Oh my God, this is good. Can I get a whole box of just these? It's so sweet, but not like over Really sweet. It's just kind of satisfying. I could eat a thousand of these. Easy. And the nice thing about Boxu is that when you really fall in love with the Boxu snack, you can order some direct from their site at a discount. Both I and the new Rockstar's office have been receiving these boxes for ages and we love them. I've seen some pics from around the office during unboxing and it's wild how excited everyone gets. Plus, every time you get your Boxu in the mail, you can feel good knowing that you are supporting family businesses all the way in Japan. So if you want to try some rare Japanese snacks with us and support the channel, click the link in the description and use the code Rockstar to get $15 off your order. Oh my God. One girl tries to signal it before another shuts her up. Now the leader is credited in the credits as Alpha One. The shouting girl is Alpha Four. And we don't really have any other name for them than Alphas for now. It's just an interesting choice to have these Canari kids speak to each other without subtitles. Now we obviously don't need the translation. We can figure out what they're talking about based on the context. But the rare choice in Star Wars to not translate what people are saying keeps Cassian and his past at a bit of distance for the viewer. Like the camera could be that of a documentarian embedded with these refugees just along for the ride and requiring us to just take all this in without any judgment. Cassian wakes up and asks B2 about who came asking for him while he was out. Pausing for data lag. Oh, this poor beat up old timer. And Cassian later asks him to lie. I can lie. I have adequate power reserves. I love it. It takes a droid extra power to lie. It's just a really cool commentary on how it really takes humans more energy to lie than to just be honest. As Cassian walks into town, the camera lingers on the town's bell tower, which we will see in future episodes. Striking metal is a key way that these workers tell time and communicate in other ways. Beneath the bell tower, we can see a bulky alien walking with industrial yellow plating on its head and back, maybe an exoskeleton to lift scrap metal. We see dozens of pairs of worker gloves hanging from a wall, kind of like punch cards for these workers to check in, but there's a few empty slots. 
maybe some who died recently on the job. Cassia tells Brasso to tell people that they spent the night together drinking Nog. Nog and Revnog come up a few times in this series. Sounds like an in-universe term for homemade booze. But Brasso agrees by adding to Cassian's fake story to include a fake part explaining why Cassian would have a bruise on his cheek. Notice how pretty much everyone Cassian talks to also comments on his injury. Just a reminder that in this empire-dominated society, any change in the routine gets noticed and must have a cover story behind it. Back in Morlanda 1, Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn makes a detailed report on those murders. Have you modified your uniform? Perhaps slightly. Pockets piping and some light. Tailoring. I love commenting on an officer's uniform in Star Wars because yeah, that suit fits tight around his core and waist. On Chief Hind's screen, the Orbesh on the second line translates to Ferrix. So the answer to Karn's inquiry was actually right there on that screen. But Hind tells Karn not to pursue it. Two dedicated Primor employees caught in the sad orbit of a right calamity. But they were murdered. No, they were killed in a fight. Yes, a third time characters try to concoct a false narrative out of convenience. Hein is on his way to Imperial inspection and doesn't want to have to report a recent crime. We see how this era is giving all of the people a strained relationship with the truth. Back on Ferrix, Cassian approaches a shop with Orbesh on the front, including the words conversion codes. Biggs detaches some parts. This looks like a pod racer engine. Her welding mask looks like the piece of a droid head. Cassian tells Biggs that he wants to sell her high profile contact a valuable part. I got an untraceable NS9 Starpath unit. Vector crystals and Imperial seals still intact. This is an Imperial navigator that shows locations and the channels that the imps use to get from place to place. Vix's partner says, We better on the Bobani run tomorrow. Wobani is a location of the Imperial prison where Jen Urso is detained in Rogue One. Wobani is actually an anagram for Obi-Wan. Sounds like these salesmen bid on scrapper runs to other planets, getting in on whatever gets found. Kind of like storage wars. I love how much we're learning about the low level economy of this society right now. Back on Kanari, the Alphas see more yellow smoke rising from that crash site. They stir darts and poison, prepping some blow dart guns. And these Lord of the Flies kids streak their arms and faces in ash as a kind of war paint. Back in the present, Karn makes an astro traffic control officer, kind of like an air traffic control operator, check the charts from the night before. The junior officer speculates that the unknown cruiser could be an Orlean Star Cab or a Daven. Orlean Star Cabs are old scout vessels that are mentioned in the guidebook in the 90s role playing game. Cassian gets stopped by Nurchi, who uses Vetch to try to intimidate Cassian. He said all I need to do was stand here. Yeah, the actor who plays Vetch is Ian White, the actor who plays the giant 1-1 one -one in Game of Thrones. The guy is seven foot one. And again, I love that they let White physically play the part and voice the character. Meanwhile, the Orbesh on the shop behind them reads screens. As Tim tries to follow Bix, he loses her near a sign in Orbesh that reads droid parts. And above that from the opposite angle, you can see it reads service as Bix passes a gonk droid. And on that droid shop wall hang a few legs of protocol droids. Also, as Tim looks around, there's another parts shop sign in a different language. This looks like at least now Hatties? Maybe something else? I just like that not all the signs are in Orbesh to show the diversity of races that live here. Bix walks into a repair shop, repair in the Orbesh there, but also out front hangs a bell or a wind chime, something later that the proprietor, Solomon Pack, will use to clang to signal other townspeople to act. Bix asks for a Mending Mesh Tech filter, Bending being a StarCraft company in universe that made the XR-12, but really this is a kind of code between Bix and Solomon for a communicator hidden in the cylinder column, and she communicates by flipping a series the switches to release a rhythmic beeping, kind of like an Indianverse Morse code. An intel officer on Morlana 1 eats a mouthful of blue ramen. Ah, the Star Wars tradition of randomly blue food. They reference an Imperial census that was done six years prior. So if this is five BBY, that census would have been an 11 BBY or eight years after the Imperial takeover. And another officer warns about cracking down too hard on Ferrix. They have their own way of doing things. I love all these little examples we're getting in this era of Star Wars about how hard it is to have any authority over all of these diverse planets and societies. In the shipyard, Cassian gets chewed out by the guard, Pegla, played by Kieran O'Brien, AKA James Tart and Ted Lasso, Jamie Tart's a-hole dad. His boss, Zorby, barks over the PA. What in the name of Chop is going on out there? Chob. So Chob's knob is an expletive used by Biff in the Heir to the Jedi novel. And we learn that Pegla knows Cassian is switching out chip logs, and he knows that Cassian used this for something shady. We end the episode back in that Canari flashback where Cassian leaves his sister behind. Yeah, that clacking percussion intensifies as we cut to black, as if to say Cassian's final glance at his sister is what hits him the hardest. Since they released the first three episodes all at once, my breakdowns of episode two and episode three are gonna be up on the channel very soon. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye.